Uh, Christine uh, Shorey Forbes was introduced to the Mormon Battalion when she discovered that her British mission ancestor was cared for as a boy by veteran John Cox in Iowa. Her ancestor then became an early pioneer in the Mormon colony of San Bernardino, where Christine was born four generations later. Christine earned an undergraduate degree in journalism from the University of Southern California, a master's degree from Harvard Business School. And uh, she was a business executive for Clorox Company, the Walt Disney Company, and Microsoft before turning her focus to her long held passion for history. Christine honored, excuse me, Christine honed her genealogical skills with a certificate in family history and genealogy from University of Washington. Go dogs. Okay. All right. That's fun. <laughs> uh, she began to leverage her skills in data analysis as a micro historian. By the time Christine met Laura Anderson at the Mormon History Association Conference, she was already familiar with the battalion soldiers who resided in California. She was thrilled to dig into the treasure trove of military records that Laura had unearthed at the National Archives. As a student, Christine never heard of the pivotal role the Mormons played in California history. Her work is now helping to fill that void. Uh, we're very pleased to have Christine Forbes as our presenter tonight. The topic is Where's Waldo? What happened to the members of the Mormon Battalion after the discharge? And uh, just to know our next presentation uh, will be the symposium in July. And after that will be September 14th, but we'll get you that information. So Christine, we turn it over to you and thank you so much. We're thank you, Brad. You. Thanks for that wonderful introduction. Today, we will follow the movements of the Battalion Soldiers in 1847. As Marianne Kirk calls it, the Where's Waldo presentation, and we're going to look at the decisions that they made along the way. This is a natural follow-up to the previous presentation I did for you. That one was called Building the Battalion Roster. I want to start by giving a shout out to my two close collaborators for both of these, Tom Brown and Marianne Kirk, as well as Kevin Henson, with whom I collaborated on the trail segments of this work. And finally, Laura Anderson, who by some divine intervention I met in 2017, who brought me into this work with the Mormon Battalion, which has been my focus and passion ever since. I call it the Correcting the Record series because our work goes into great detail soldier by soldier, and this inevitably challenges the simplified, constructed narrative that has been repeated for so long it's been accepted as fact. For us to really understand the decisions the men made in 1847, we have to set that constructed narrative aside and look at the primary sources with fresh eyes. All right, so um, we're gonna cover three things today. The first is the numbers, which we're gonna look at by discharge group. Those are the three groups listed in the legend on the right. For each of these, we'll ask three questions, which are represented by the bars. And we will have numbers added to those as we go along. The first bar represents the total number of soldiers who are still on the active muster and payrolls who are with their discharge group on July 16th, 1847. The next bar is how many of them got to Salt Lake City that first year. And the final one is how many of those remained there for the winter. These numbers are our guides to some previously obscured elements of the full story of the battalion's experience. You are gonna see that the simplified story left out some of the most dramatic parts that we're gonna be telling you about. And it tends to have a good guys, bad guys theme that we hope to dispel which leads us to the significance. And once you see the full story, I believe you may have a new understanding of not just the experience of the soldiers, but also the importance of the battalion to the overall story of the Camp of Israel. Norma Rickett started this work when she created a flow chart that tracked the movement of the soldiers. Now I've obscured the first part of Ricketts' chart because we covered in the previous presentation. We're gonna start with the 496 soldiers on the payrolls. I've also obscured the bottom of the chart because that is the subject for a separate presentation that will be coming up at some point. There are three ways that we build upon Ricketts' work. First of all, digitization has given us access to far more sources than she had. 
And software like Excel for in particular has allowed us to keep track of things a lot more easily than the index cards Ricketts used. And it includes analytical tools we've employed to find trends and correlations and to make accurate accounts of all kinds of things. Excel makes it easy to do something her chart did not attempt to do, which is reconcile the numbers at key time frames, just like the battalion muster rolls did. They accounted for each soldier every month. Were they present? Were they detached? Were they discharged? Were they dead? We're going to do the same thing at certain time frames of interest. And finally, we're distinguishing and prioritizing primary sources, the contemporary sources created at the time over later accounts. So a word about that. Many battalion historians have tended to call all personal accounts journals and weigh them equally. You'll see that in footnotes. The problem is that memory is inherently imperfect and any account that comes from memory has been influenced by knowledge of what eventually occurred. To make sure we didn't distort the contemporary observations, we created a system of coding personal accounts so we could easily discern the reliability. Only those accounts written at the time are called a journal. Those are coded number one. Some of those documents called journals have been added to by hand later, which we note when that happens, or typed up, in which case it's impossible to tell what may have been altered. So we use the original handwritten version whenever possible, which we code as a 1A. In this presentation, when you see a personal account in the tan box, you're going to know it's a journal. And Tom Brown has transcribed, compiled, and indexed these so we can view accounts of various men on the same day, and we note every mention of another soldier within every account. He's found many of the key statements that shape this work that we hadn't been hadn't really seen before, hadn't seen published. The, the, the stories that are in gray boxes are later reminiscences, which we code number two. These are published recollections such as bounty and pension statements and others collected by the church. And Marianne Kirk has been invaluable with collecting, reading, distilling, recording the information from all of these sources, and we've put that into our data set. We also want to thank everyone who's volunteered with Laura and transcribed journals, letters, and everything else on Kindex. The third one in priority would be the secondhand account, somebody else's account of what the soldier said. And then the fourth one is the family stories that do provide clues. And But if there's conflicting detail, we give greater weight to a, a, an earlier source. That We combine them all into a data set about the battalion, and then we integrate information about the men from other data sets as well that we've created, from the Camp of Israel, from uh, certain lists from Salt Lake City, et cetera. So it's this astonishing set of sources that gets us the story. And uh, we're very excited to share that with you. So let's look at some numbers. We get the numbers by sorting and filtering our data set. We add them up in various ways, depending upon the question we're asking. This is gonna show you what we mean by reconciling. We start with the 496 soldiers on the payrolls at the top. And we're gonna keep track of the numbers in the various groupings over time. You'll notice at two different points on this chart, the rows add across the total, the 496, shown on the right. The main command in, is shown on the right in blue and the detached on the left in orange. And in the middle are the events that cause a soldier to be removed from his active unit, primarily death or resignation. And both of those events were noted on muster rolls. For the detached, there's also an event we are calling informal release. So you see that minus one to winter quarters uh, in orange? That represents Roswell Stevens, who was detached with Brown in Santa Fe, but was actually released by Brown to go directly to winter quarters with John D. Lee. The same was true of Woolsey and Tippetts, who were sent as messengers to winter quarters soon after arriving at Pueblo. The bottom row is our reconciliation for January 27th, 1847. We chose that day because it's the day the main command arrived in California. We get to the orange total at the bottom by subtracting the orange deaths and departures from the orange total. And the blue at total at the bottom in the same way. Blue subtracted from blue. So these color, the ones in orange or blue represent the soldiers that are still on the active muster rolls on that date. The gray totals at the bottom are the combined death and discharges for the orange and blue. Now there's two orange boxes because 
147 of the 158 detached soldiers were at Pueblo, and three of those on the active rolls were informally released to winter quarters, but that is not reflected on the muster rolls. The Army did not know about that. Together, a total of 150 detached men were on the active rolls. Ten had died by this time, eight from the detached and two from the main command, and one, Samuel Gulley, had resigned, which gave us a total of 335 soldiers who arrived in California January 27, 1847. From here, we will follow the 150 detached, then the 335 at San Luis Rey. Finally, we'll combine them at the end to answer our pri three primary questions. So we'll go through this in groups, starting with the detachments. And our first question, how many of the 150 detached soldiers on the muster rolls as of January 27, 1847, were with their command at discharge? As the, discharge, as the detached were never formally discharged, we will arbitrarily use the July 16, 1847 date for discharge. The journal of one of the privates at Pueblo, John Steele, helps us understand how Captain Brown prepared the men at Pueblo for discharge. These entries together suggest that Brown had been instructed to get the detached to Salt Lake as soon as possible in order to plant crops for the emigration that would soon be arriving. There were rumblings of men who did not want to do this, but instead wanted to go back to Iowa to join their families. And John Steele tells us that they were strictly told that was not an option. Captain Brown, Captain Higgins, and a few others went to Santa Fe in March, hoping to get their pay and also an early discharge. Steele's entry on April 9th, when they returned from Santa Fe, tells us that the plan to get to the Great Basin and plant corn was not going to work out. Not only did, did they learn that no one in Santa Fe had the authority to discharge them, but they were ordered to go to California and start there on the 25th of May. You'll recall from a previous slide that 147 were at Pueblo, January 27th, and three were at winter quarters. By the 25th of May, six more of the detached men had died, so there were 141 at Pueblo, May 25th. That day, the three who had been sent to winter quarters were with the Brigham Young Vanguard at Chimney Rock. On the 25th, the day they left, 139 of the 141 left with, with Captain Brown, and they went north. And on June 11th, when they got to Lodgeville Creek, they met the three from the Vanguard. They had been sent uh, with Lyman, Amos and Lyman, to meet the, the detached. Lyman had been sent to quell discontent from those who wanted to return directly to their families at winter quarters instead of going to Salt Lake. So he, he got all, all 139 plus the three all went north to Fort Laramie. Two, though, from Pueblo disobeyed those orders and went directly to winter quarters. Lyman wrote a letter to, uh, to Brigham Young from Laramie and labeled those two men deserters, as did Thomas Bullock on his roster of the incoming soldiers with Captain Brown. But that was in the eyes of the church only. The army knew nothing about it. Lyman's mission was successful in that once they got to the main trail, only two more, quote, deserted, at least in the eyes of the church, because again, the army didn't know. And Higgins informally released two more to go east, Marcus Eastman, who was not a member, and William H. Walker, who was an adoptee of Heber C. Kimball. So 135 left Fort Laramie with Brown and three left with Lyman. And so even though they were going back and forth somewhat between the Vanguard and, and Brown's company, we're gonna call that 138 with their unit at discharge. This reconciliation at the bottom shows that all 138 who left Laramie arrived in Salt Lake with either the Vanguard or Brown, and that six of them had left Brown before getting there. Below that, the six are divided into what happened at the by the end of the year, and it, what happened is William H. Walker met his wife in Spencer Eldridge Company on August 31st, so he arrived with them in September in Salt Lake. So that means that there were 139 altogether uh, from the detached who did reach Salt Lake that year, but not all at the same time. We're gonna next look at how many of them stayed for the winter. Ricketts implied they all did, and you're gonna see that's not the case. 
first we're going to look at their family situations when they arrived to see that very few detached arrivers had family in Salt Lake. In fact, the only ones who did were those whose families had been detached with them. There were 28 of those. There were 13 who had a battalion relative that was also a soldier, but their family was at winter quarters. There were four with what we're calling a changing, a marital transition. Um, we, you know, uh, three of the men left, their, their, their marriages ended, and then one, so there was Tubbs, Gribble, Hirons, and Stillman, so we're calling those four a changing wife situation, uh, but four, 93 of them had family at winter quarters, and so that may explain what happened next, which is that over 100 detached soldiers left Salt Lake within weeks. Um, and that's all but four of the soldiers who did not have family in the caravan. They didn't leave for California as the army had ordered. Only seven soldiers went west. The rest went back to winter quarters. That's almost 75%. And an equal percent of the vanguard did the same. This is one of the facts that has been simplified right out of the preferred narrative. We have therefore a running total starting with 138 who arrived on July 29th, uh, steadily decreasing until there were only 32 left by the end of August. Now, 15 of those that did head to winter quarters met companies headed to Salt Lake and turned around and returned. So there are 15 turnarounds, plus William H. Walker, who we're calling the one late arriver. Uh, plus, so that brought it back to 48, and then five of those of the seven who went to California returned. So we did get up to 53, but, Four more were sent to Southern California on a relief mission with uh, Captain Hunt, which we'll mention later. So 49 spent the winter, 49 of the detached spent the winter in Salt Lake. Here is the 49 in Salt Lake, and then we see that 85 of them were at winter quarters, six in California. By this, by the end of the year, 15 were dead, and three uh, who had left the church. Let's move on to the main command and the first question. That's a photo of the Pueblo de Los Angeles in the foreground and Fort Moore is on the hill where the flag is. Starting with the 338 who are not detached from the main command en route and subtracting those who were detached, who died or were discharged, 335 arrived in California. Two more were discharged in California. Sylvester Hewlett resigned in March and John Allen was drummed out in May. Two more died, and 14 were sent with the Kearney escort. So that brings us to 317 soldiers who mustered out in Los Angeles, July 16, 1847. And that's the answer to our first question. We will now touch briefly upon the Kearney escort and then end with the 317. And do note that with Hewlett's resignation, the Kearney escort had 14 soldiers, not 15, even though Sylvester Hewlett did travel with them, he did so as a civilian. Ricketts had seen a journal entry that indicated he'd resigned, but she knew he went with Kearney, so she sort of assumed he hadn't. But we've looked at the military records that show that the resignation was accepted and recorded on the muster rolls. Uh, John Binley, who was with them, was injured on the way. And so when they got uh, to uh, the Mormon Ferry, he was left, he was allowed, he was basically, Carney discharged him and let, let him uh, go to Salt Lake with one of those companies. That means 13 went on from Laramie to Fort Leavenworth. They were discharged there and all 13 went on to Council Bluffs. So that is our answer all in one for Kearney. There were one at one at, at Salt Lake City and 13 at Fort Leavenworth. Okay, so for the 317 in LA, we need to look at this question in five stages, which I've labeled A through E on this chart. How many of them went of the total went north? How many arrived at Sutter's Fort? How many went east from there? How many continued on from Truckee Meadow? And then how many got to Salt Lake City? So there were choices they had to make along the way. We're going to start with discussing the factors that influenced the decision they made in July in Los Angeles. They had three choices in July. They could re-enlist, they could return to their families, 
or they could remain in California and work somewhere. The re-enlist option originated in March of 1847 when Hunt wrote to Carney's adjutant offering the services of the Mormon battalion for a second year. Turner wrote back and agreed, and the majority of the commissioned officers supported the plan. Shortly after Hunt received Turner's agreement, however, Levi Hancock drafted a petition for early discharge that he wanted to, to forward on to Kearney and got the soldiers to sign it. Not surprisingly, the commissioned officers refused to forward it. Early discharge or not, Hancock continued to influence the soldiers against the reenlistment plan, disparaging the officers who supported it as choosing the Gentile agenda against that of the best interests of the men. When Hunt met Kearney in Los Angeles in May, Kearney was strongly supportive of this reenlistment effort. So Hunt sent a letter, I'm sorry, my cat is right here, hopefully. <laughs> anyway, uh, Hunt sent a letter to Brigham Young with Kearney telling him of Kearney's support for the plan. And some have suggested that Hunt had the idea of reenlistment himself and was asking for Brigham Young's approval. But the wording here shows he was simply informing him. The idea may have actually been Brigham Young's. And Brigham Young did tell, uh, Hunt did tell Brigham Young that the soldiers were against it. And he went on to talk about how they were inexplicably against him and he wasn't sure why. In June, their commanding officer at the time, Colonel Stevenson, went to San Diego where Company B was to, to recruit for the reenlistment. And he got 23 men to sign up and then came back to Fort Moore. So June 29th at Fort Moore was this big meeting in which the soldiers debated what is the best way to follow Brigham Young's counsel. At that meeting at 8.30, Colonel Stevenson made a strong plea for reenlistment. After that, the soldiers adjourned to a barren site out of earshot to the west of Fort Moore to discuss whether reenlisting was what Brigham Young would want them to do. At 10 a.m., the officers spoke, and then they reconvened at noon when the men could offer their thoughts. The first to speak was Captain Hunt, who urged the necessity of maintaining the ground we had gained, meaning they had at this point respect in California and were poised to gain some real power within California's military organization. Um, that, so that quote on the left is from Henry Standage's journal, and then the letter on the right is an excerpt from a letter that, uh, Kurt, that Stevenson wrote to Mason, who was the appointed military governor. And that letter shows that Hunt and other commissioned officers had been upfront about their intention to get military control of California for the Mormons. If they could recruit five companies for a second Mormon battalion, Hunt would be third in command in the whole territory. Lieutenant Dykes, had an interesting turn of phrase to emphasize Hunt's point about maintaining the ground they'd gained. He said, we should remember the case of the good cow who after having given a good pail of milk, kicked the hole over, hoping that would not be the case now. So that's, I just love that phrase. Lieutenant Canfield said to the, in essence, if we do show up, the question for us is gonna be, why did you all show up here? rather than why did you re-enlist, which is what they told us to do. The commissioned officers referred to a secret council of the 12 with the officers before they departed as their justification for re-enlistment. And that made us curious. What was said in this secret council? In fact, what did Brigham Young say to everyone at Council Bluffs about why the battalion would be a good thing for the Camp of Israel? There were three key speeches that we looked through in, with a fine-tooth comb here, uh, in which Brigham Young gave lengthy and persuasive explanations to the saints about why recruiting the battalion was a good thing. So you can see those listed there on the slide. Um, these two excerpts that I've selected essentially say to people, we are all going to California. We are going to be settling there. We're going to meet the battalion caravan there. And when they're discharged, they will have reach their home. So now we're gonna go a little bit farther back to see that the idea of California was actually not a new one at this point. It was the one that the saints believed at the time. 
So this is a letter, an excerpt from a letter that Brigham Young wrote to Samuel Brannan in the fall of 1845, which was right when they decided to make this plan. And he said, can you just get 10,000 of the brethren uh, in the East Coast to San Francisco and we will meet you there. The circular that was distributed to everyone right before they departed indicated that they were going to go to make a crop in a valley near the Rocky Mountains, but and they'll make a resting place there until they can determine a place for a permanent location. You could interpret this as meaning somewhere in the Great Basin, but in fact, if you look at it in the context of all the other communications that they'd given at the time, all of those indicated some place on the West Coast. What really seals it is this song written by the Council of 50 member, John Taylor, that the Council of 50 member Erastus Snow sang to the large gathering of saints at the October conference at the Nauvoo Temple, which is when they had first learned they'd be leaving Nauvoo and going west. The pioneers sang this song on the trail and excerpts typically only include the first couple of stanzas, but the fourth stanza is explicit. Our towers and temples there shall rise along the great Pacific Sea. So with that in mind, let's go back to the secret meeting that was referenced during the discharge debate. Hunt and Hunter were present at the July 15th Quorum of the Twelve meeting and Willard Richards recorded a few key points from that. First, that soldiers can tarry and go to work when they are disbanded. That's what he told them to do. And the second, this is when he announced that the next temple would not be at the Pacific, but it would actually be in the Rocky Mountains. And he wanted the 12 and the old brethren to live in the mountains where the temple will be and where the brethren who will live other places will have to come to get their endowments. On the 18th, Brigham Young told all the officers of what to do with discharge. He said, go about your business. He told them that they were going to the Great Basin where the temple would be, but you're going to be dismissed about 800 miles from us and go about your business there. The gentleman pictured here is Isaac Williams, the influential owner of Chino Rancho. The battalion was acquainted with him because in April, some of the men were detached to guard Cajon Pass in order to protect Williams's cattle. And on June 13th, several other men were detached to cut wheat to grind into flour to use for the journey home. This excerpt from the letter Hunt wrote to Brigham Young as the Kearney escort was departing in May tells us that Williams had offered to sell his land to the Mormons for their headquarters, and Hunt wanted to know if he should accept that offer. You'll note in the text that he that Hunt noted that Chino Rancho was sufficient to support 50,000 families. It took over 13 years for the population of Utah Territory to reach 50,000. So that's a that that clearly shows that Hunt expected that the emigration would be making their headquarters at coastal California. As a side note, Brigham Young sent Amos Lyman to California in 1848. He wasn't able to go until 1849 in order to try to negotiate the purchase of this very ranch with Williams. In that 10 a.m. meeting, David Pettigrew spoke for the ill Levi Hancock and gave the argument against reenlisting, saying that their charge had been to ensure peace in California and that since that was done, their duty was now to their families. And at the close of the second private meeting, Levi Hancock showed up and spoke at the door of the tent to counter a claim that he had influenced the men against the officers. He basically said, I never did that. Well, that is actually not true. Hunt led an effort to oppose Hunt's leadership soon after the arrival of John D. Lee. And the kerfuffle that ensued from that point was the precursor to the division that remained in the battalion at discharge, so much so that the companies traveled separately even when near each other after discharge. Much of that debacle seems on the face of it inexplicable and sets up a good guys, bad guys narrative. We're gonna go back for a minute to, his, to John D. Lee's arrival September 17th before we come back to the men in Los Angeles 
on June 29th. All right, so Lee with uh, James Pace and Egan met the battalion just as they had left the Higgins detachment and were beginning to follow the Cimarron cutoff. Now, Tyler claims that uh, the men objected to their families being separated from them. The journal accounts, like this one from Levi Hancock, though, indicate that their concern was actually about themselves missing Betts Fort because they were pretty much out of provisions. And that's where that was their best shot at getting them. Gully also wrote this interesting letter that day. Um, we hope to get to General Kearney safe, and we think we shall winter in Santa Fe or return to Fort Bent. The families had left us. We're going direct to Santa Fe. So he expects they'll be returning to winter there. This idea is also mentioned by several of the soldiers in their journals at this time. So this made us curious. Why would they think that? We found why. Willard's Richard, Willard Richard's account of a conversation Brigham Young had with Lieutenant Allen as the soldiers were departing Council Bluffs tells us that when the soldiers departed, the latest word from the military was that as eager as they were to go on to California from Santa Fe, should they be successful there, the Southern Trail was not passable. This map, this is an 1845 map of Kearney's pre-war expedition route and they had nothing on it below the Arkansas River. They didn't know what was down there. They had no idea what you might do. And so they, Carney had planned that they would go up from Bent's Ford up to South Pass. So that's what the men thought they'd be doing. Because um, I, I guess I this, this conversation, or he knew of no road. He still knew of no road to California. So... John D. Lee did create quite a ruckus right when he got there, but it really came to a crisis on September 26th when they got this news. A Kearney Express came through and informed, the main, informed them that Kearney was actually going to go on a southern route, something they called the Chihuahua Trail, and he expected the battalion to follow them. So getting to the coast was, of course, what Brigham Young had wanted for them when the battalion was created. But if after their departure, he changed the main destination to the Great Basin, he would want the soldiers and everyone else to end up there, not the coast. So what if Lee had been set to join the battalion, not only to get the pay and to bring a letter to Kearney about Mormon leadership, but also to try to influence the location the battalion would be spending the winter? And clearly, such a big potential change of plan would be not be ready to be made public. So the reason this we know that it created such a crisis is because that very day, September 26th, that they learned they'd be following Carney through the desert to the Pacific, Gully wrote a letter to Carney requesting that the battalion overwinter at Bent's Fort instead. Lee tells us that Gully wrote the letter, quote, for Captain Hunt, but we can be pretty sure Hunt knew nothing about this. And I'm sure when he got Turner's response, he was wondering what it had to do with, but of course it, it was not agreed to. At the same time, William Corey described an insurrection he called a, quote, secret influence taking place at that time. And he names Lee, Pace, Hancock, Lytle, and Hyde, and says they were trying to remove Captain Hunt and put, promote Gully to lead the battalion. This is some desperate measures here. They must have been desperate. Fleek wrote, it is surprising that some of the prominent members of the battalion were actually involved in this ludicrous episode. Well, the fact that Gully, Pace, Lytle, and John D. Lee were all adoptees of Brigham Young, raises the question, is it possible that these men and these men only have been given confidential information from, from Lee about this change in destination for the main body of saints and that they were expected to act upon it, but they couldn't share it? That would put Lee and Hancock in a really big bind. This didn't work out, of course, and Goley's actions are what likely caused him to lose his staff position as assistant quartermaster uh, once he arrived in Santa Fe. 
that same day, which was the 13th, um, the officers, other than the Company E commissioned officers and a couple others, wrote to Brigham Young to recount the surprising events. Gully ended up resigning and departed with John D. Lee on October 19th. And Hancock wrote to Brigham Young a letter he gave to them to, at the time um, saying, Brother Pace, Gully, and Lytle have sought with all their power to carry out the designs of the Twelve, and they have been silenced. So clearly, John D. Lee had been given directions by Brigham Young he couldn't reveal, but his directions appear to have been to get them back to Bent's Fort and try to get them not to go to California. That seems to have been the plan they were hoping for that they couldn't be upfront about, and it didn't work. So now we're going back to June 29th. What do we know about that? We know that at that time, both sides firmly believed Brigham Young was on their side. And this exchange from, that David Pettigrew recorded is really interesting. He said, Lieutenant Dyke said, I believe if President Young was here, he would counsel the brethren to remain in the war. I rose and said, I don't believe any such thing. I know better. Well, said Dykes, there's so much difference between us. Time will tell, said I. So in the end, how did the reenlistment efforts go? They did manage to recruit more than enough for one company, far more. About half went with HP, went with the um, Hancock Pace Lytle Company. However, if you add everyone else up on the other side of the chart and call it all weighted work, which was Young's original directive, it ended up fairly equal. I want you to notice that there's no mention here of a Horace Alexander company. Um, and that is because there is no such thing. Um, we have sources for four out of the five of the men that Ricketts had placed in this so-called company that clearly placed them in the HPL company. So we have some theories about why she may have come up with this from some family stories, but uh, it's just not true. We'll focus from here on the companies who went north. And although in her chart, Ricketts combined all going north into one company and called it Hancock, we're gonna follow two distinct companies, Hunt Dykes, with whom we've identified 45 soldiers who, headed, who went with them to San Francisco and our renamed Hancock Pace Lytle Company of 164 who headed to the California Trail via the Walker Pass. So to answer the first question for the 317, Altogether, 209 went north, not 223, as Ricketts had suggested. We can now follow the 209 who went north with one of the companies and look at the decisions they made along the way. So the, the question of how many of them arrived at Sutter's Fort is an interesting one because neither intended to go to Sutter's Fort. It ended up it just ended up happening. Now, there's a common perception that the faithful would have gone with HPL and that anyone who went with Hunt had been enticed into Gentile ways and just wanted to live a cushy life along the California coast. Um, and we are actually going to debunk that perception. We've compared the the set of individuals that went with Hunt versus those that went with HPL and then also the re-enlisters to on, on various measures to see how they were the same and how they were different. The men with HPL and Hunt were each more likely to be married than the re-enlisters and HPL in particular, even more so. Um, Hunt's group tended to be a bit older and far more likely to be commissioned officer, to be an officer, especially a commissioned officer. So an index of 100 means average. If it's an index of 282 means that's almost three times as likely. That's how that works. So uh, what's interesting here is these loyalty factors. This percent of the California remainers in 47 who went east the following year is the same percentage for Hunt and Hancock. About 80% of them, those who, who stayed in California, stayed for a year. That's a lot higher than the re-enlisters. And the number who stayed in California through 52 and even after 58 were equally small in both groups. 
So you cannot make a claim that one was more loyal than another. They just had different sets of understandings. So we're going to do a real brief look at Hunt dikes going north, and then we'll spend more time with HPL. So Hunt's first stop was in Monterey. He got there on the 9th. That was the capital of California at the time. And he was going to try and get authorization, written authorization from General Mason for a 2nd Battalion. He got there and found Mason wasn't there. So he left him a letter saying, please send me a letter. I'm going to be at the Presidio in San Francisco. Some of the men who had come the, at, that far with Hunt remained there to work, and the re, uh, many others went on to San Francisco. In San Francisco, Hunt did receive Mason's affirmative reply, which actually even indicated you only needed three companies, not five, and you, you can be lieutenant colonel. Uh, but still, it was clear in that letter that they, everyone still thought the immigration was coming. With receipt of the letter, Hunt and some of his men decided to go east to meet the camp of Israel and begin recruiting. While in San Francisco, Hunt also met with Pacific Island missionary Addison Pratt, recently relocated there, and Pratt recalled in his reminiscence that most of the men who arrived with Hunt intended to work around San Francisco. Pratt also noticed, noted that he sent a letter with Hunt as he continued east. So the, their next stop would be Sutter's Fort to get provisions. Now we're going to go back to HPL, and they are in Los Angeles on July 20th. That's the day Hunt left. The day Hunt left is the same day that uh, Leva Hancock and David Pettigrew organized the return company. Well, not return company. They'd never been there before. The company to go home. They uh, named Pace, the captain of the first hundred, and Lytle was the captain of the second hundred, and there were 10 pioneers led by Elisha Averett that went out in front. And these were then there were three captains of 50s, Hyde, Tyler, and Allred. They stopped first at General Pico's ranch to get cattle that they intended to drive with them, but it didn't take long for them to realize that herding cattle on the trek wasn't going to work. So they stopped, uh, they were in that mountain range there right above Francisco Rancho, and they stopped to slaughter and jerk the beef, which allowed the last of them to join them. So by the, you see that little quote on the right-hand side on the 30th of July, the last of the brethren caught up, we numbered 164 in all. That's our number. Um, Walker's Pass was their intended route eastward, which I have noted in purple in that dotted line. Um, they were going to take that along the east side of the Sierra Nevadas up to the California Trail. And Elisha Averett was out ahead of the group, and they scouted the route ahead. With no map or trail, they hired a guide from the ranch where they bought the cattle. This map, we, the red line I drew on here, shows where they were on August 12th when these quotes were reported. So they're still looking for Walker's Pass on the 12th. They're well past it. They're almost to Fresno, and they would have wanted to turn east at Bakersfield. Um, so that's when they decided to head north to Sutter's Fort and follow Fremont's route. Now, by the 21st of August, HPL had gotten to the Merced River, which is near present-day Modesto. And at the same time, Hunt's group was approaching from San Francisco, and neither knew the other was headed there. At the Merced River, HBL learned that there was a settlement of saints nearby. They weren't sure who they were, but they would learn that this was the agricultural settlement of the Brooklyn Saints called New Hope. They had planted crops, according to Brigham Young's direction, for the Camp of Israel's emigration companies that would be arriving. HPL also dispatched four scouts down the Merced to find them, the rest of them camped that night at the Stanislaus River, and four more scouts were sent ahead to Sutter's Fort to inquire about provisions. The four scouts arrived at Sutter's on the 23rd, while the main group camped at the Mokalumni River. And this is where it gets really interesting. Sutter tells us that the four scouts who arrived at Sutter's on the 23rd were the second group of Mormons to get there, 
we can infer that the first group were with Hunt as there weren't any other possibilities at the time and we know they had been there. Also arriving that day were two men coming from the East. They had just been with the Brigham Young Vanguard. That's Charles C. Smith, who was a partner in a store at Sutter's with Samuel Brennan and had gone East with him, and Archibald Little, who had been in Pueblo with the Mississippi Saints. So Smith and Little brought the news of the immigration. That was the first news anyone had that the immigration was bound for Salt Lake and had 500 wagons almost there. The next day, August 24th, Hunt himself came to Hancock to bring him the news at the Cons Consumnes River, and he brought with him Archibald Little. So that's uh, the first time Hunt and Hancock had seen each other since uh, July 20th. Later that day on the 24th, uh, the HBL scouts returned to their camp on the Consumnes with more news. Sutter had good paying jobs. So that day, several of the men concluded to stay and work. We have sources for 16. We know who 16 of them were who decided to tarry and work for Sutter. And they did so with the blessings of the camp. On the 26th, as HPL reached Sutter's, just as Hunter Hunt was departing. So that gives us our count. About 184 in total reached Sutter's. Now that's not a firm number because we don't know how many stay behind in either Monterey or San Francisco. We've just made a guess. We've said that 25 stayed behind in one of those places and 20 went on. Hancock mentions in this note that Hunt's mission to recruit a new battalion, uh, he thought he still needed five companies, but now it had been gone down to three. Hancock didn't know that, but he still didn't think it would happen. Hunt left Sutter's on the 26th, and that's, that's that Orange Arrow, Hunt Dykes Merrill. And the next day, the Pace 100 left on the 27th, and on the 29th, the Lytle 100 left. So Hancock, Tyler, and Allred were with Lytle. The Averett Pioneer Scout Group is no longer needed as the trails are known. So they generally stayed in uh, this one, two, three formation. Hunt and Hunt's company and Hyde's 10, which at that point included James and William Pace, were out front and they camped the night of September 5th at Truckee Meadows, which is present day Reno. You can see the rear where the rear companies of Pace are and the entire, entire Lytle 100 were staged behind. The morning of September 6th, the two forward groups had begun to climb the next set of foothills when they came upon Samuel Brannan returning to California from the Vanguard, well, from Salt Lake, actually. So Brannan and his partner, Charles C. Smith, had gone east to meet the Vanguard. And while Smith skipped Salt Lake to go directly home, Brigham Young asked Brannan to guide Captain Brown and his small contingent from Salt Lake to California. There were six other detached soldiers with Brown. One of them was Jefferson Hunt's son, yeah. Brennan told them Captain Brown was a day behind and suggested they return to Truckee Meadows so they could all meet together when the Pace and Lytle companies could catch up. So on September 7th, Pace's 100 met Hunt, Hyde, Brannon, and Captain Brown at Truckee Meadows. The men were thrilled to receive mail from family members for the first time in almost a year. James Pace recorded that after the letters were read, quote, at a proper time, the attention was called to hear the epistle from the 12. And Lytle's, Lytle's company came in at night later, so they weren't there for this. The letter told them essentially, if you want to stay here in California, if you want to stay in California for a season, that's fine, but it's best for you to come here to Salt Lake directly. This is going to be our headquarters and our dwelling place, and we'll go get your families, so come. So this was the first time they'd heard news of this. And this news from the church would have thrown Hunt's recruitment plan into disarray. Although Brigham Young's letter encouraged them to continue, the men who came from Salt Lake told them there's really not a lot of food or provisions there. So unless you can go all the way to winter quarters, you'd better stay in California and work. So a lot of them, and we count 71, you're adding those, the 12 and the 59 in the orange bar, 
those turn back from Truckee Meadows. And those in the yellow bars, that's totals 97, continued on. Those in the red bars had remained in California already. Altogether, if you add the red and the orange, 112 men who had gone north wintered in California. The left circle in this Venn diagram includes the 45 soldiers in Hunt Dyke's company. The right circle includes the 164 in HPL. The middle circle is the overlap of each of those in those companies who worked at Sutter's that fall. You'll remember from the last slide that a total of 112 between these two companies remained in California or returned from Truckee Meadows and wintered in California. We've identified 53 men who worked at Sutter's during that time. Addison Pratt's reminiscence stated that 56 soldiers did, which is specific enough to believe him and is exactly half of 112. So the other half of the soldiers who returned or remained from those two companies worked elsewhere. For example, HPL returner Samuel Miles went to work as a store clerk in Benicia, which is a town on the waterway between Sacramento and San Francisco. And Hunt returner Zadok Judd went to work as a tailor in Monterey. All right, so we've got all of these bars filled in here. We've got 97 going east from Truckee. We now just need to know how many got to Salt Lake. All eight soldiers who had arrived at Truckee Meadows with Hunt Dykes reached Salt Lake City. We know from Philom and Merrill's reminiscence that nine men traveled in that group. He's counting Jefferson Hunt's son, Gilbert, one of the detached soldiers who arrived at Truckee Meadows from Salt Lake City with Captain Brown. Gilbert returned to Salt Lake with his father in that company. He is counted among the detached, not in our 300 and not in our 317 data set. So for the purposes of the 317, there were eight who traveled in Hunt Dykes, but in total there were nine. Hunt Dykes Merrill were the first of those from Truckee Meadows to arrive in Salt Lake City, and they did so on October 11th. So that concluded the effort to recruit a second battalion. Hunt then turned his attention to helping those who were in Salt Lake City get established the best way he could. Within a month of arriving, Hunt proposed leading an effort to go back to the rancheros in Southern California for the seeds, cattle, and other supplies they desperately needed and had no other way to obtain. This was approved by the High Council and Hunt led this very successful effort with Asahel Lathrop. The, in the HPL company, uh, the 89 left Truckee Meadows. And then in September, they split out a slow group. Robert Bliss was asked to lead a group of men who are sick. Uh, so September 18th, and then on September 27th, Hyde and about a dozen others decided to go ahead more quickly. So you can see the arrivals at Fort Hall, all 89 arrived at Fort Hall, but staggered. So by the time the PACE group got there on the 6th of October, Hyde had already gone. At Fort Hall, the, the HPL group divided once again, where seven of the men broke off. This was Averett, Allred, and five others. They decided to skip Salt Lake altogether and go directly to Fort Bridger. Therefore, 82 of the 89 arrived in Salt Lake City in these three different groups with one straggler. So a total, the 82 plus the eight is 90, a total of 90 from California arrived in Salt Lake. Um, of them, uh, most, 71 of them had family at winter quarters. The only 15 had family with the Pioneer Company already there, and 10 of them had family with the battalion caravan. Of those 71, 42 went on to winter quarters. That's more than Ricketts had said. The other 29 remained for the winter. And by the next year, all were reunited. Either the families got to Salt Lake or the men got to winter quarters, one or the other, by the next year. 
I want you to, I want to just note here, this is a picture of uh, my, my book of uh, Norma Ricketts, and this is her list of the 26 men she said went from Salt Lake to Winter Quarters. She said that she, on page 80, she quoted Tyler when she said that 32 men went from Salt Lake to Winter Quarters, and she listed these 26, but you really have to use the list with caution. Some of it's right, but um, some of them she got elements of the story wrong and she did include you'll see that i've crossed out six names altogether they did not at that time at all so be very careful all right so now we have the question how many of the those 317 wintered at salt lake the answer is 55. there were 42 at winter quarters and 218 in california and two were dead so 55 were in salt lake this is the wrap up for the 317. Of course, the number with a discharge group was 317. 90 went to Salt Lake, 55 wintered at Salt Lake. Now we're going to combine all three together. And the totals here 469 of the 475 soldiers were, who were still on the rolls July 16th, 1847 were with their units on that date. The only ones who weren't were the six men who left Captain Brown's company uh, at, at that point, so from Pueblo. 230 of the 474 battalion veterans who were still alive got to Salt Lake that first year. And I put this little chart here of the percentages of the group who do that by far the the detached, uh, far more of the detached got to Salt Lake than of any other group. And 106 of the 230 soldiers who got to Salt Lake that first year spent the winter there. So this pie chart shows you the relative proportions, um, far more at winter quarters and, and the most in California. I've now compared our numbers with what Ricketts and Tyler, based on Tyler, have suggested. So where she really is off is she counts all of the, but she didn't realize the detached left Salt Lake, so many of the detached left, and she didn't realize that it's, she count, she assumed most of the men with HPL went on to Salt Lake and the opposite was true. And winter quarters more went through than she thought. So our conclusion here, um, the numbers, we have updated, sourced, and reconciled flowcharts of the battalion movements in 1847, and we will be sharing those broadly in various ways. These numbers have revealed previously obscured stories, like the return companies from Salt Lake to Winter Quarters, that change our understanding of where the soldiers spent their first winter. That, with the advice given at Truckee Meadows to return to California and work for a year, showed there was a rougher, slower start to Salt Lake than Tyler or others have implied, which to me means in the long run, it was an even greater accomplishment. Battalion journals and letters of those of the 12 during that pivotal year shed light on the entire camp of Israel. Our work has shown us that there are two valid sides to the post-discharge story in Los Angeles. A choice to re-enlist or go north with Hunt and Dykes might have been in service of the church's objectives, not in defiance of them. The idea of an alternative set of instructions that could not be shared, that was the true catalyst for the inexplicable mutiny John D. Lee incited along the trail is something I think we need to study further. We've also clarified the two distinct companies that departed Los Angeles and, and um, that it's found that it's, that neither intended to go to Sutter's. That was a happy accident. And it's interesting to imagine what would have happened had they actually found Walker's Pass. The thought I hope to leave you with is to encourage you to set aside as best you can your knowledge of the eventual outcome as you evaluate the choices the men made at the time. I hope you'll consider viewing the story through this new lens and let go of the idea of the good guys and bad guys as much as we can. Thank you.